Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's time. Uh, good evening. I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us to, uh, in tonight's uh, webinar, Finding Your Silver Learning. Uh, the webinar is about an hour, uh, and we'd like to make it as interactive as in, as, and as engaging as possible. Uh, we'll allow question and answer uh, towards the end of the session. And uh, we'd like to hear your voices. If you have questions, all you need to do is just raise your hands and we'll give you uh, mic access to uh, raise your questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, give a special introduction to uh, one of our uh, senior consultants uh, based in New York City, uh, Mark Nibbins. Uh, Mark Nibbins has been working with us for a while. Uh, he's been involved uh, in Bahrain with so many companies. He recently uh, worked with the executive team at Usul Asset Management. He have worked with the executive team and the senior management team at the National Bank of Bahrain and Tatwir Petroleum. Uh, Mark is both a, a PhD holder from Harvard University and a lecturer at Harvard University. Uh, Mark have worked in all seven continents around the globe. Uh, so Mark, uh, all the best and uh, I'll disappear. Great. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, we have to qualify the comment, Mohammed. I have not worked in Antarctica, um, but the other ones uh, for sure. And uh, it's a great pain for me right now not to be able to travel for work and for pleasure. So, salam alaikum, everybody who's uh, in the Gulf region. I hope you've um, had a nice breaking of your fast and I may have now your full attention that you've got some food in your stomachs. And uh, it was about a, about a month ago that I uh, accepted the offer from Mohammed to do a, to do a webinar uh, on leading with resilience in times of crisis. So tracking for me in New York City, we're in week 10 now of being shut down. Uh, I live with my family right in the middle of New York City, so it's been a little bit surreal. It's, it feels like a science fiction film sometimes. And, um, and this is sort of the new normal for us. Uh, you know, there's been talk from the governor and the mayor about when the schools might open, when restaurants might open again. Uh, only a couple of shops like grocery shops are open here and pharmacies, everything else is, is really just shut down. And at this point, I think we're not looking at anything meaningful before early June. And that will probably be for necessary businesses like construction. Uh, I think when it comes to businesses that are working in, in office settings, it's probably going to be the fall or maybe even longer before many workers go back to work. So the topic of today's webinar, if you will, presentation, is finding your silver lining in the COVID-19 crisis. And I'm going to make um, I'm going to make a confession to you, which is that when I did the session last time, I had already written an article on the topic and I'd even published it in Forbes. I have a regular probably once a month or so I publish an article in Forbes online. Uh, in this case, I didn't uh, finish the article yet. I'm writing it right now. So what I would love toward the end is if you do have questions, if you see things I'm missing, um, I'll, when I get to the last slide, I'll put up my email address. If you want to send me some feedback, I'll be working on finalizing this article in the next day or two and then publishing it. So um, I, this is a chance to make it better. It means I also will be looking at some of my notes if you don't mind too much. So um, we'll see what we can do. So let's start out with this idea of a silver lining. Uh, this, is a, this is a phrase we use regularly in British and in American English. And when I was talking with Mohammed about possible themes or titles for the seminar. He liked this, but then he said, you know, it's possible that not everybody will know what a silver lining is. So let me explain to you, first of all, what does this phrase silver lining mean? Now, as Mohammed mentioned, I did my PhD, but I did, did not do my PhD in business. Uh, unlike probably everybody else on this call, I did an advanced degree in the humanities. And in fact, my PhD is in literature, principally early British literature. And there's a, a poet that many of you probably have heard of, if not read, named John Milton. He's very famous for a poem called Paradise Lost. And uh, he wrote many other poems and various kinds of political tracts and things. And uh, one of his poems 
is called, it's a play actually, it's called Comus. I won't bore you with the play because it's actually quite boring for modern readers. Uh, I had to read it back in graduate school, but this is actually where the phrase, the silver lining comes from. So Milton wrote a couple hundred lines into this little play. Uh, one of the characters says, I see it, not ye, not you, it, I see it visibly and now believe that he, the supreme good, to whom all things ill are but as slavish officers of vengeance, would send a glistering guardian, if need were to keep my life and honor unassailed. Was I deceived or did I see a sable cloud turn forth her silver lining on the night? And here we go. I did not err. There does a sable cloud, a dark cloud, turn forth her silver lining on the night and casts a gleam over this tufted grove. So the character is a young woman. She's lost in the woods. She's very anxious. And what she finds out is that this dark cloud, which would normally be a bad thing, has to her mind a kind of silver lining and she can see some light coming out of it. And that light guides her way and helps her get out of the woods. So it's a long way, now you have a, a, a bit of trivia you can use at a cocktail party sometime, but it's a long way around of saying that what this, what this phrase, a silver lining means is that every apparently bad situation, if you look at it in the right way, can offer you something good. This requires us to be uh, a little bit optimistic, uh, a little bit brave. It requires us to keep things in perspective. And I, uh, when I was writing an early draft, I'm, I'm in a draft of this article right now, and I shared, I shared a draft with a couple of my colleagues, and one or two of them said, you know, Mark, this is a pretty serious situation right now. Um, I don't know if people are going to take this silver lining as being a little bit cavalier or you know maybe you're not taking this seriously enough and and i thought through it and I, i'm going to stick with it um i think it's a memorable phrase and i think it is critical for all of us as leaders to lead in bad times as well as good times right it's easy to lead when times are good people want to follow you they want to be on a leading team everything is coming easily clients and customers are knocking down our door when times get tough this is when we really need effective leaders. So the headline, and I'll come back to this at the end, is I'd like all of you to think about what do you see as your silver lining in this crisis? And I can't offer you a specific set of things because it's going to be different for each of you based on your business, your industry. Um, living in New York City, I have friends who are CEOs of big companies, of small companies, uh, in financial services, maybe they're private equity, maybe they're in technology or media. But I've also got many friends, including myself, who run very small businesses, who run restaurants, who run, uh, I have a couple of my friends run bookshops, which is not considered an essential business right now. So while some restaurants can stay open, bookshops can't. Uh, I've got a lot of friends who are um, responsible for very, very cash flow dependent businesses. And this really is an extremely difficult time. So how you find the silver lining, how you go about figuring out a way to not only survive this current crisis, but to have, it, have your company come out of it stronger is going to be very different for everybody. But I think there are a handful of principles that I can share with you. And maybe you can use these principles as a way to go back and take another look at your business and say, okay, what can we be doing right now to position ourselves that as we start getting back to normal, we can actually accelerate out of that. And like a lot of my work, I am um, an advisor to CEOs and executives. I, I do a lot of my work with executive teams and, and um, uh, executive coaching. Ultimately, it all starts with you. Right, so we can talk about the business, we can talk about your balance sheet, we can talk about Porter's five forces, all these things are important, but at the end of the day, you are the thing you can control. So start with yourself. Where am I focusing my time and energy? Uh, how am I telling the story about where we are right now, and where we're going? How am I keeping people focused on what's most important? Where am I, where am I projecting myself? Um, and, uh, and how am I managing my own stress? So when I think about what's most lead, needed from leaders right now, I think about a couple of these kinds of things. First of all, there is resilience. My last webinar was all about resilience. How do you keep yourself flexible? How do you stay adaptable? How do you not burn yourself out? 
Um, I, when we sort of shut things down here in mid-March in New York, I had planned to take a flight to meet some clients in Madrid and London the first week of March. And as we were finalizing our plans, this, these are the uh, managing partners of a private equity firm. And uh, one of them is based in Berlin, one of them is based um, in Tokyo, one of them is based in Milan, London, and then in Madrid. And they called me up and said, you know, Mark, we're going to postpone this meeting. And I thought, well, this is crazy because you guys are all masters of the universe. Are you afraid to get on a plane? And they said, no, we're not afraid to get on a plane. We're afraid we won't be able to get back home. And you should be afraid of the same thing. So stay in New York. And what they said was, don't worry, this will be over pretty quickly and we'll pick it up in a couple of weeks. In other words, maybe you'll just fly back over to Madrid in early April rather than early March. That was... Um, in retrospect, kind of hilarious because here I am now 12, week, 12 weeks later, I have not left New York City and most of the time I actually haven't even left my home. I'm sitting at my dining room table right now. My children just finished their school. So, uh, so how are you maintaining a level of resilience? How are you, whether or not you're responsible for leading others, how are you leading yourself? Right? Keeping yourself focused, focusing yourself and your business on what is most essential. Um, I'll go into this a little bit, a little bit later, but however you started out 2020, whatever kind of plans you had, those have by and large gone out the window. Uh, and you can sort of whistle a happy tune and hope everything is going to get back to normal, but we're not going to be back to normal for a while. And whatever normal looks like in the future is not going to look very much like, at least in the near term, what it looked like in the past. So the ability to keep your focus on what's most essential, not getting distracted. Leaders right now need to be willing to collaborate, to empower, to communicate. We're all sequestered at home. We can't be together. Human beings are social animals. Um, business, the, the beauty of business is that a group of people can accomplish something that somebody can't accomplish by themselves. We learned that over the, the many, many centuries of, of human culture. And right now, we're not able to work together directly. We're not able to be together. We're not able to remind each other of why what we're doing is worth doing. So as a leader, you have to be extra diligent about reaching out, communicating, collaborating, empowering your team, getting leverage from them. Uh, and that's a, that may be a shift in mindset for some of us. I think there's also a, a, a critical importance to be emotionally intelligent and to be generous. And I'll, I'm going to wrap up at the end with this idea of generosity, which is kind of an odd, an odd word to use for leaders. Um, you know, if you look at any company's leadership competency model, I would be surprised if you found the word generosity on it. We talk about intelligence, innovation, ability to build strong teams, ethical, uh, moral compass, these kinds of things. I don't think you'll see generosity as a criterion, but I think it is a really important one. Uh, and it's the one that's all about how am I engaging others in whatever we're doing so that they can see that they will personally benefit. This fear, which I think is latent for all of us, the, the concern in times of change, when we join a new company, when our company is, is either doing well or struggling, will I benefit in this? Is this going to be good for me? Is this going to be good for my family? That has clearly been completely exposed right now in this crisis where people are not just worried about their job, they're worried about their ability to, um, to take care of their family, to care, take care of their family in very basic ways like keeping them from getting sick, never mind providing food and clothing and shelter. So this is a good time for leaders to be particularly aware of what I call the human side of business. Right? That said, at the same time, we have to be good business people. We have to be able to step out of the status quo and look for opportunities that other people may be missing, particularly your competitors. Are there ways to do things differently? Are there ways to do new things? Are there ways that we should stop doing things we used to do because in the new world, they're not really gonna be that important after all. And that finally takes courage. It takes courage to challenge your assumptions and it takes courage to leave the past behind. For those of you who are sailors, you know that early in your, uh, in your training as a sailor, you typically are sailing where you can always see the shore, right? This coronavirus pandemic 
is forcing us, if we're going to survive, to be comfortable sailing out beyond the horizon where we can't see the shore anymore because that shore is not going to be the shore we're going to be focused on in the future. So I wanted to start, and look, I could probably talk for the whole hour about just these six things, but any ability for you to be effective right now and coming out of this crisis is going to be predicated on your ability to first and foremost focus on yourself and to be the leader that your people, your customers, your family, uh, and your friends need you to be right now. So make time to do that. And then as I said, what I'd like to focus on today for the next half an hour or so, and then we'll get some Q&A, is what is the silver lining of the COVID-19 crisis for your business? So uh, I can't think of any business other than maybe Zoom, which uh, or you know, go to meeting or the other half a dozen. I've learned all these at this point. All my clients use different ones. Um, Google Meets, uh, even Amazon's gotten in the game here in America. There's something called Chime. Uh, so there's you know half a dozen different tools we're using for uh, meeting in uh, over video. Other than that business, there's not a lot of businesses, uh, you know, I guess uh, face mask manufacturers, not a lot of businesses that are really seeing that this is be a, a good time for them. Uh, we're all struggling. We're all struggling in different ways. Uh, even if you've got a lot of cash and you're a subscription business and you can conduct your business from, from remote, I work with um, a couple of professional and financial services firms who have moved to a remote model really easily. Uh, I think, much more easily than they've expected. They were surprised how easily, and it's beginning to now raise questions of, you know, did the old model make any sense at all? Um, but all of us have to figure out, given the pressures we're under, what kinds of things can we do to find a way to help our business survive and maybe even accelerate it? I will share with you, um, I'm very, very lucky that my job allows me over the course of a week or a month to talk with many, many different kinds of leaders in different industries. I work in basically every industry. I don't do a lot of work in, in pharmaceutical. I don't know why that is. It's just maybe just a, just a peculiarity of my practice. But um, every other industry from high tech to heavy manufacturing I've worked in in the last 20 years, and I get to see different kinds of leaders, different personalities, different industries talk about their business system. Garrison has a, a, become a great friend of mine. He is responsible for a family-owned business in the third generation called Southern Auto Auctions. Um, it's an interface between dealers and fleets, um, rental car fleets, the fleets that are coming off uh, the old model year for auto manufacturers to basically get uh, used cars, lightly used cars into the marketplace. And you know, when you think about the business, you think about volume, you think about um, the ability to manage pretty complex operations. In normal times, they run an auction every single Wednesday, and they run about five or 6,000 cars through the auction in, in, in about three hours. So it's an incredibly complex business. It requires a great deal of um, technical proficiency, uh, very, very uh, close attention to uh, cash flow collections. Um, there's many, many transactions in a given day. And what he said when I asked him, what are you seeing as your silver lining? I was, I was delighted to see that it wasn't their technology or their robust operations. It was, he said, seeing our people. And they, this company takes very good care of their people. It's a family business. They treat their employees like family. And seeing their ability to change and adapt, um, not holding on to the way we used to do things, not getting caught up in and, and being frustrated about this is no longer normal, but rather being able to pivot to this is what it is right now, and we're going to do the best we can. So whatever he's doing, and at some point I'll sit down with him and, and try to understand what he thinks it was that he built in, he and his, his uh, father-in-law, who's the, uh, the prior generation, uh, what they built into the culture of this business to allow it to be as resilient as it is proven to be. So looking for your silver linings, I'm going to propose seven areas of focus. None of these will be surprising to you. Your strategy, your customers, your products and services, improving your business, innovating, improving, looking at your cost base, taking out cost, looking at your people, and looking at your community. And however you might want to define community, that could range from your local community all the way out to uh, your community of, um, uh, you know, 
business partners, your uh, your supply chain, whatever it might be. So hard to imagine uh, any of you who've been working in business for more than about a half an hour would be hard pressed to say, yeah, well, this is um, not exactly uh, incredibly novel advice because these are the things that we should be looking at all the time. So what I'm gonna propose is I go through each of these and I'll touch on some examples and some ideas. I'm gonna propose that we wanna look at these things but we want to look at each of them in a slightly different way. So if you'll bear with me, I'll take you through these seven, uh, and then I'll offer, as I said, some comments on the way. And then when we get back to the end, I'll offer a concluding comment, and we'll see if we can open it up to some questions and answers. But here's the meat of the presentation, which is, in these seven areas, how can you be thinking differently about your business and looking for your silver lining? So first and foremost, it's important that we reconsider our strategic priorities. So we're in mid-May. Before you know it, we'll be at the midpoint of the year, the calendar year. If you're on a calendar fiscal year, it'll be the midpoint in your, in your fiscal year. And as I said earlier, whatever priorities you had, whatever your business plan, I'm sure you felt great about it. You finished up 2019, you invested your team in thinking about what are our big rocks for 2020, where are we really gonna excel? Uh, you might as well just take that and throw it out the window because whatever you thought was going to happen in January has not turned out um, to be the case at all. Uh, so we have to fundamentally rethink what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it, right? Presumably our fundamental vision hasn't changed, our purpose as a company. That's not our strategy, that's our, our mission or our purpose, but our strategy is how we are going to achieve that. What are we specifically going to be doing in the next three, four quarters to create a roadmap that will allow us to reach certain milestones, um, deliver results to our customers, do it in a way that we're, um, you know, maintaining the best margins we can and keeping our people engaged and building more organizational and business capability. So one way I've been thinking about this with my clients is to say to them, Let's look at that original plan from back in, the, back in January or February, the, the one that you polished up and maybe presented to your board. And let's just take, offer a, a simple sort of um, a lens to look at it through. And the first question I would ask is, of the things that you were planning on doing, which of them will you still do, right? Um, you may have to do them in a different way, but you want to have very essentially a couple of things that you're still committed to do as a business. There are probably some things you were going to do that you're not going to do right now. You're going to hold off on those. You're going to hold off because you haven't got the resources. You haven't got the bandwidth. Um, it's not the right time to launch something new um, or because you just want to be able to really keep your focus on what is most critical right now. And again, for big businesses, this will be different from small businesses. If it is principally about preserving cash, that's one thing. If it's about figuring out how do we get our products to the customers who want to buy them, but don't have the ability um, that you know, we've normally had to actually get to them because our sales force is on the beach or you know, we are, our sales channels are broken. Um, so the third area I think is going to be, and this one takes a little bit of courage, realizing that there are some things that you're probably never going to do right? They seem like a good idea back in January. And the reality is that the world has changed enough that you're going to say, this is, this should no longer be part of our strategy. As human beings, it's very hard to do that. We've got a lot of sunk costs, sunk intellectual costs. And the idea of just giving something up can be very difficult. But if you look back, I won't turn this into a business school class, but if you look, uh, look back at some of the companies you most admire, they're often ones that their strategy is not only what they do, but also what they don't do. And I always push my clients to say, let's think about are there things we're currently doing that we shouldn't be doing because by doing these things, we're diverting precious resources from the things that really make a difference. My favorite example of this is Apple computers. Uh, we have an Apple household because my family all likes Apple. I'm kind of ambivalent about it, but here we are with 87 different Apple devices. If you ever try to get an Apple device repaired, you're in for a big surprise because Apple has clearly decided they're not in the repair business. They are, you, you take your, your iPod shuffle in. I had one I used to use to go to the gym. They don't even make it anymore. 
I brought it in and said, could you fix this? They said, yes, we can fix that for you for $200 or here you can buy a new one for $59. Pretty easy. So with that as sort of a, a reminder, diligence in your strategy includes not doing things. And I think this is a great time to look at what you're doing and say, we're not going to do that particular thing anymore. And then finally, are there things that you had not been doing, maybe you thought about them, maybe you hadn't thought about them, that you should start doing? And this is very, very easy to see in a lot of small businesses. For example, um, restaurants in my neighborhood have by and large shut down. And the ones that are surviving are the ones who are offering takeaway and who are offering um, delivery. But there's a handful of them that have been very, very clever and said, well, we can try to make it by working on um, just a delivery model, but why don't we do this? It's a neighborhood. We know there are people who wish they were able to come back to the restaurant and join us. They can't do that right now. Rather than just simply offering a delivery menu, what if we offered um, a service which is for one or two days a week, we will essentially cater a full meal to your house. All right, this is unheard of in America. Catering is a whole different kind of business. You hire a caterer for a wedding. But I've been really impressed by the resilience of these and the creativity of these companies to say, we have this capability. We want to get it to our customers. We want to keep our customers loyal. We want to please them in ways that we used to please them when they could come into the restaurant. How can we try to replicate that behavior? So a very simple example, but I think a very powerful one. The second one I'm going to suggest, and again, we could talk about any one of these probably for the next hour, and it's, um, it's a little bit painful for me to have to just talk to you. I can't uh, talk at you. I can't listen to you, but I'd love it, again, if you would ask some questions for later on or consider sending me your, your thoughts and, and ideas and even questions via email. So the second thing we'd like to do is to reconnect with our customers. Now, this is pretty difficult when our customers are also locked up in their houses, but I think it is really an important time to make an extra effort to reconnect. I know I've seen a lot of companies and a lot of businesses who are mostly trying to avoid their customers right now. They don't know what to tell them. They're, um, they're struggling with uh, how they're going to translate the value proposition that they've always sold into this new model. Uh, I don't want to pick on, uh, I will pick on them, but there's a, there's a company in the United States called J. Crew. They make clothing, um, all, all of retail. I, I expect everyone in the world, but particularly in America right now, retail is an absolute bloodbath. But about five years ago, I bought a pair of socks from J. Crew. I think, I don't remember. Uh, I now get an email a day from J. Crew, who, by the way, just declared bankruptcy, uh, attempting to sell me something. Here, you need some socks. You need a new sport coat. You need a new pair of pants. I mean, the desperation is, is absolutely uh, kind of astonishing. And, you know, what they haven't realized is that, no, I actually don't need a new pair of pants. I don't need a sport coat. I probably could use a new pair of sweatpants or maybe some new pajamas because I'm not leaving the house at all. Are you guys selling bedroom slippers? Maybe that would be nice to walk around the house and keep my feet warm. Um, so businesses that are simply sort of trying to do more of what they've always done are doomed to fail. We're gonna talk more about vulnerability later. I think this is a time, particularly if you're in a services business, to demonstrate some vulnerability, right? We're all in this together. Nobody has answers. No one's got a clear playbook. So why not reconnect with your important customers, desired customers, and frame a whole different kind of dialogue with them. Ask them, how are they handling this? Ask them if they have any ideas they could share with you. Ask them, here's a great question. Can you think of anything we could be doing for you? It might not necessarily be part of our historical product suite or our, or our services, but maybe there's something we can do that would be useful to you and we can at least continue to provide value along the way. If nothing else, um, you've got some time on your hands, you're not flying around. Uh, I'm an introvert, it doesn't come naturally to me, but I have been trying very hard to reconnect with my current clients as well as past clients. I'm not trying to sell them anything, I'm just trying to say, look, I'm here, I'm thinking of you, and if you wanna talk, then why don't we get together and um, you know, have a cup of tea together virtually. This is, a, I think, a nice segue into my third one. And I remember my third one up here was uh, products and services. And clearly I would like you to take this time, as I said, in your strategy 
to think about the products you're offering, to think about the services you're offering. Are these the right ones for right now? Are these the right ones for tomorrow? But I'm gonna make a radical suggestion here under the topic of products and services. And I'm gonna say, why don't you consider just giving some things away? All right, now, if you're a product business, you know, you need to do a calculus to say, is there a benefit of giving things away that would um, not damage our pricing when we get back to normal, that would, um, you know, we could, we could do a calculation versus the cost of inventory carrying, uh, you know, but is, is there a way that we could give some things away to our customers to keep them, and I, I, I coined a phrase, it's really hard to gain market share right now, but I think you can gain market share of mind, right? So how could J. Crew do a better job of reminding me that they're my favorite clothing company when I'm also getting emails from Nordstrom's every single day and from Banana Republic every single day and from Polo every single day and from Nike every single day, right? It's all just noise to me at this point. Um, and no, I'm, not next, I'm not suggesting they should have a fire sale. That doesn't seem to work. Um, but if you flip it over to services, financial services, professional services, if you're essentially in the advice business, I think this is a tremendous time to give things away. I work with some content providers, ratings agencies, uh, regulatory agencies, various kinds of people who are offering advice on government, on um, economics, macroeconomics, and obviously your standard consulting and advisory firms. And many, many of them are generating new content that is really meaningful to help their customers and clients get through this crisis. Um, they're offering webinars. They are uh, getting on the phone and talking with their customers and saying, what kinds of information or advice could you use right now? And we're not going to charge you for that. We, we, have, we all have a lot of time on our hands. Um, you know, don't tell your CFO this because he's probably you know, pulling his hair out at this concept. But um, if this stuff, whether it's physical or whether it's, it's intellectual, is sitting around gathering dust, how can we deploy it in a way that we can deepen relationships? Right. So again, I think this is going to be different from organization to organization, different from industry to industry. I've been very pleased to see some of the major newspapers in America, as well as some of the periodicals have been offering where normally they're a, they're a subscription model. They've been offering free subscriptions. They've been offering um, access to certain parts of their library, for example, things related to uh, working through a crisis, uh, if you've got uh, proprietary or aggregated data related to how to get through the COVID, how to, how to, how to track the, um, the progress of the pandemic. These are the kinds of things that I think there's a real value as well as a real positive karma to giving away. So a kind of a radical suggestion here, but I would urge each of you to go back and, and think about this. And when I ask you to go back and think about this, by the way, um, I don't mean just go back to your home office and lock the door and think about it. I mean, engage your teams. Each of these questions, um, the seven areas that I'm focusing on are great areas to challenge your teams to think about. Um, even not just the executive team, but pick high potentials who are lower in the organization, who may see things differently than you do, who may understand the market or your customer's buying patterns or psychology different than you do. And there's really a time to do some, some tough thinking about challenging the status quo and challenging a lot of your uh, traditional assumptions. The fourth area, obviously, I think, I think this is obvious, is now is the time to innovate and make improvements. Um, improvements to your physical space, improvements to your intellectual capital, your intellectual property, um, taking a look at processes that haven't been working. And I'm seeing this all over the place. There's a, a little local restaurant and pub up at the corner. We live in Harlem and over the last couple of years, the neighborhood has gentrified more. We're getting nice little places where we can bring the family on a Sunday afternoon. There's a nice place up at the corner. And I walked past there about two weeks after the shutdown. And I noticed that the owners, the family who owned it, it was a nice warm day. They had the windows open and they were absolutely cleaning the place out. They were doing a new paint job. They were sanding down the bar and re-varnishing it. They were cleaning up all of, the, um, all of the furniture and even hanging new decorations. So while they can't serve their customers right now, they can use this downtime in a really productive way to 
uh, make improvements. Uh, a lot of services firms that I work with and even that I, I, I tap into to help me are using this time to train their employees, to do the continuing education, to get new certifications, right? This is a time to build more capability. If there's things that are broken, now is the time to focus on them. So improve broken processes, in, you know, invest if you can in new systems and find ways to build the infrastructure and capability that you will be able to benefit from, again, when we come out of this crisis and start to accelerate. Okay, obviously the next one for many of you probably is the first one. I decided to hold off on it a little bit, but that is do some hard thinking about fixed costs and the cost of doing business. And what I'm finding is very interesting as I talk with a lot of my clients, um, particularly the ones who have transitioned to working remotely without really very much, um, very much sort of turbulence at all is everyone is now sort of going, are the ways we thought about working historically, does this actually make sense, right? Do we, do we need to have a whole bunch of people traveling into New York City or other major cities every single day and sitting side by side in offices? Uh, because, you know, after, for most companies, particularly services companies, after your um, personnel costs, probably your real estate costs, are your second biggest cost real estate and travel. Uh, we're not traveling right now. Do we need to keep traveling when we get back to business? I love traveling. Uh, as I've now got small children, I am a lot more deliberate about when I do and don't travel because I like to be home, but I love, nothing I love more than getting on an airplane, going someplace new, going someplace I haven't been before, going someplace I love. I, I mean, I was really looking forward to going to London back in early March, one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, but I think I will think differently about this. I've started a couple of new coaching engagements with CEOs. One of them is in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. One of them runs um, the business for Europe for a private equity firm. And these have begun over Zoom. Uh, I'll talk more about Zoom in a minute, but I think we can do a lot more with a lot less. And I think that's gonna be a rallying cry for a lot of the businesses that come out of this yes. pandemic um, in a strong way. So think about costs and not just taking out costs in kind of a crude way because you're under pressure, but think about it in more elegant ways. How can we do more with less? One of the obvious places to be looking uh, as well is at your talent. And I, I could do an entire seminar on this topic, but I think now is the time is don't have to let anybody go. They're very lucky. Others are having to let a lot of people go. Uh, a couple of my uh, private equity portfolio companies have been told by their owners, look, we're going to take a beating on revenue this quarter, the next quarter. Um, we have to maintain margins. You have to let 40% of your staff go. And that, that is really brutal. Um, and those of you who are in that position, you've got a lot of, a lot of my sympathy because I know how hard that is. But even if you don't have to, you know, I, I want to not be callous about this, but this crisis gives you an umbrella to do a lot of major changes. Again, whether it's changes in your service offering, in your operations, it's also the possibility to do, to make changes in your personnel, right? Um, consider your org chart. Is this the right organization structure? Is this the right design for leading the business in the future? Um, when you're thinking about possibles or if the business is struggling, don't just saw off arms of the org chart. Look at the people holistically, because one of the things that I believe is, while I think skills and experience are important, I think as important, or in some cases more important when your back is against the wall, is people who are really committed, people who want to change. Um, this is, again, this is a little bit of dirty laundry, but I've been telling some of my clients that this crisis is a great way to assess which of your people are really committed. Who is raising their hands to do more? Who is taking the opportunity to make themselves better versus who is just kind of disappearing and sitting at home and watching a lot of movies? I, I love watching movies, but this is not a time to, uh, to sit on the, on the sidelines and see what happens. This is a time where if you're committed to your organization, you should be leaning in and putting your shoulder against this. So I do think this is a great time to think about your, your, your talent costs and are you getting the absolute uh, best bang for your buck with where you're spending money on payroll. Um, you know, I would say one more thing uh, on those lines is do be careful not to trim 
too much because you want to make sure that you don't, uh, unless you have to, you don't over downsize so that you have a hard time coming back out when, um, when things pick up. But these are, you know, for all of each of your businesses, these are going to be very, very uh, specific and subtle kinds of conversations. I'll head into the home stretch now. Um, the next one is demonstrate your humanity. Uh, this is one of the one of the most important topics for me. It's a topic that um, it's, a, it's a leadership capability. I think it's a, it's a leadership style that, as I get older, I appreciate more and more how important this is. You know, there's been a lot written about how the millennial generation is forcing us older people to think differently about the social contract. I think that's true, but you know, I think that that question has been around for a long time. Uh, why do I follow you? Is it because you're the boss? Is it because you have a title? Is it because you're smarter than me? Well, these could all be reasons, but ultimately I follow you because of who you are. And as, as you look back over these slides, I've talked about your business in terms of what you do, in terms of how you do it, which is your strategy, in terms of why you do it, which is your mission, your purpose, but there also is who you are. And what I think is gonna be interesting, and I, I spent the last slide talking about having to let people go, uh, there is gonna be a tremendous market for talent for people who have been let go, who are great performers. And now is a tremendous time to think about acquiring people. And when you're bringing people in, you know what this crisis has really done is it has exposed all of us um, to who we really are as people. So I mentioned earlier that uh, the Zoom technology has been fantastic. Uh, I do think when we get back to normal, it will no longer be, well, I have to either do the meeting in person or by phone, and I'm going to do it in person because Zoom is a crappy substitute for meeting in person. Uh, that's a false way of thinking about it. We, now, now that we're all getting comfortable with video, what we're going to realize instead is that uh, it may not be as good as being in person, but Zoom is significantly better than the telephone. It's also exhausting, and that's all the topic is how do we deal with the Zoom fatigue. But I think in the future, we're going to recognize that this can be, particularly if I'm not talking to a couple of hundred people, if I'm talking to one person or three or five or even 15 people on my leadership team, there is a lot of intimacy in this, right? I can get right up close to you. We're never this close when we're together at a table, and we rarely are unless we're you know, very, very comfortable with each other. Um, you're in my home right now. Have a look around. This is my dining room. There's pictures of my children in the back. Um, you now know a lot more about me than you probably would have if we just met in a conference room somewhere. So this crisis is exposing our humanity, and I think it's reminding all of us about what is most important, which is our families and our health. Not to say that our businesses are not important, but I think we've had a good rebalancing of this. And that coming out of this, those of us who can choose where to work are going to be particularly mindful of the values of the people we're working with. Are these like-minded people? And again, that's something that we sort of painted the millennials for. I think they were just more honest than the rest of us at talking about how important that was and voting with their feet. So now is a great time to demonstrate your own humanity. Um, there was a great video, if you didn't see it, look it up from the CEO of Marriott, Arne Sorensen, just a couple of weeks into the crisis. If you can imagine a worse business to be in right now than the hotel business, I'd love to hear what it is. And he gave this, I mean, the, the video is a masterclass in speaking honestly and vulnerably to your employees. Find ways to spend more time with your people, even if it has to be this way. Share with them your thinking. Share with them how you feel. Um, don't be afraid to be honest. And seek opportunities to build even stronger connections, even though we have to do it in this somewhat alien technology. Um, I think coming out of this, one of my clients said to me, you know, what's really interesting is that you've got to be very careful how you're behaving as a leader right now, because when we come out of this, all of your people are going to remember how you behaved. And I think that's a very, very powerful observation. I also think, and I've read some articles, that the market is going to be watching how leaders behave through this. And I think we will, particularly with the rise of ESG, I think we will see uh, a lot of impact in terms of not just who are the best companies in terms of 
profitability, but who are the best companies in terms of doing the right thing in an extreme situation like this one. Uh, I'm, I try to be an optimistic person, but my sense is that uh, we're not done with COVID-19, not by a long shot, and that I wouldn't be surprised if this isn't something we're dealing with this kind of a dimension to our, our normal lives for years and maybe decades to come. This is not going away. Okay, last one is to demonstrate generosity. I mentioned that earlier, and generosity doesn't mean just giving things away. Uh, it is a mindset, but it can include giving away non-tangible assets, giving away your time, spending time asking people how they're feeling, making sure as a leader that you're approachable, making sure your teams are spending time looking out for the well-being of their people. It's funny, when I, um, I wanted to choose some, some entertaining pictures for these seven criteria, all seven criteria, because they're about business and organizations, are about people. And it's really hard to find good pictures of people socially distanced, to use as examples. So I had to revert here to, a, I think it's a lovely drawing, I think this comes from the United Nations, a lovely drawing showing this is kind of maybe the new kind of neighborhood we're gonna have. We have to wear masks, but you know we're finding ways to engage with each other. We're finding ways to, um, to demonstrate that generosity. Generosity starts with giving of myself, um, uh, understanding that we're all equal, we're all God's children, and figuring out ways to help each other, support each other, um, and be there for each other. Above and beyond that, if your business can do this, uh, I think this is a tremendous time to do the right thing by your people. Uh, Dan Walsh, who I don't know, uh, but he's an, uh, the newish president of Marsh and McLennan, a huge global uh, you know, holding company of various kinds of services firms. Um, he came out a couple of weeks ago and said, look, we're all doing what we can. We trust you. We trust our culture. And we're not going to be counting sick days or vacation days, right? Now, look, for startups, uh, a lot of Silicon Valley startups have said, we don't give vacation days. We don't want to carry that liability. We trust that if you're any good, you will manage your time and you'll get your work done and you do what you need to do. But for a large very traditional company like Marsha McLennan to do something like that, I think was remarkable. Um, I know that there are examples of big companies in New York City who have large employee cafeterias and a number of them have said, and I'm working on, I got to get some actual company names. I don't, I think I've got a couple, but I don't want to name them until I'm sure they're doing this. But what they've said is it's important to us that we keep our food service people employed. They have families to feed as well. Uh, so we're gonna bring them in and obviously they can't make meals for our employees because they're all working from home. So we're gonna continue to make meals and then we're gonna distribute these to various social organizations. We're gonna bring them to homeless shelters. We're gonna provide them to the first line responders. We're gonna send food from our corporate cafeteria to the hospitals and these kinds of things to, um, to help support. So any kind of ingenuity in that way, I think will go a long way. The, the, the cost is minor, the benefits are amazing. I wouldn't do it merely as a sort of PR stunt, but I think if there are ways that you can find to give back to your local community, um, you know, this, this, um, this pandemic has done one thing for all of us, you know, I'm very comfortable for the last 25 years jumping on an airplane and flying anywhere in the world. It has really reminded me that m much of my life really is rooted in a small piece of New York City. And I've been much more cognizant of my neighbors, what some of their needs are, helping out people who have been impacted. When I go down to the corner to go grocery shopping, I'm often picking up a bag and bringing it to somebody who I know could use some groceries right now. So I think this is a really good time to demonstrate generosity. And I think it's a great way, if you're struggling with um, how you get through this psychologically, doing something good for somebody else can often be incredibly invigorating and um, inspiring for yourself. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up. We've got a couple of minutes still. I don't have to drop off at the top of the hour, so I'm happy to hang around for a while. And the common theme in all of what I've said comes back to one of the things I most passionately believe, which is as a leader, as a human being, you have to control what you can control. Right? I'm sitting in New York City. I can't control this pandemic. 
I can't control when the government will let me go back to work. Um, I really can't even do what I want to do, which is go out for a long walk because we're supposed to stay in. And if I do, I go out with a mask. But even then, I'm feeling like I'm probably not doing the right thing. So I have to focus on what I can control. This is a picture of the Roman philosopher Marcus Aurelius. He's a fascinating uh, character for me. He's one of my heroes. He was born into being the emperor, and he decided he did not like being the CEO of the Roman Empire, so he gave the job to his brother, and he went off and he became a general defending the borders of the Roman Empire against the barbarians, principally up in what's now modern-day Germany. And what he did on the cold nights out there on the, on the front was he kept a journal, and the journal has been we, we, it survived, thankfully, and you can get a copy of it now. We call it the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. It's, that's not what he called it. He, he called it his journal. Um, but it's a very, very powerful piece of writing because he shares his own experiences and his upbringing and his, what his teachers taught him. And he constantly goes back to the people who are happy and the people who are successful are the ones who focus on what they can control. I've had a copy of the meditations of Marcus Aurelius on my bedside table for at least 30 years. I've read every single translation into English. And for me, it's a constant source of a, a reminder that no matter how bad things are, I can get up in the morning and I can focus on doing some good based on fo focusing my effort and my psychology around what I can control. All right, so there we are. Um, I'm gonna ask you to think about this question as you leave today, I hope this has been somewhat helpful or at least catalyze some ideas. I'm going to ask you to think about what kind of a silver lining can you find in your own situation? Again, do it by yourself, but then bring your team together, challenge your, your colleagues, challenge your peers, challenge anyone in the organization. Now is the time for us to think differently and to come up with some good ideas. Thank you, Mark. Uh, you've certainly engaged me uh, and 180 other uh, uh, participants who were uh, with us for the hour. I think we'll take the first question from uh, Mariam Turki, uh, and she wants to ask it live. She's on mute. Mariam, you have to unmute yourself before you can talk. There we go. Mariam, okay, the mic. there we go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Dr. Mark. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting session. I uh, surely enjoyed it a lot. I actually had two questions, um, and you kind of answered it towards the end, but I'll ask it anyway. My first question was, what are the type of questions do you ask yourself um, to apply emotional intelligence in a workplace when you feel under a lot of pressure, especially during the COVID-19 and um, don't let the emotion actually take over um, your, your job or the work that you're supposed to be doing. Right. And my second question was, um, given that the whole working from home is uh, fairly new to everyone, and um, it's kind of still, are, some people are still resilient, especially to managers. How do you change their mindset that actually working from home is uh, in the benefit of an organization. Great. Well, I'll, I'm going to attack the second one first because I think that's the easiest one. And I can tell, I can hear some children in the background. So I'm guessing you Sorry. are working from home and uh, yeah. dealing with the <laughs> I'm going to mute myself that. so you can, okay. That's beautiful. It's wonderful to see. I, I think it's great. I now know um, everything about all my clients, including what kinds of children they have, what kinds of dogs they have, and what kinds of artwork they have hanging in their homes. So it's been a fun way to get to know people. I think it's fantastic. Um, so look, there's been a lot written on working from home. I think the most important thing to do is to recognize that we're all dealing with a couple of variables. What kind of space do we have? What's our personality? And what are the kind of dynamics around us? I think it has to start with, and you can, there's been a lot written on this. I can follow up through Muhammad if you'd like with what I think are a couple of the particularly good articles. Um, a lot of it comes down to structure and habit and figuring out what works for you. So what I've noticed is that working from home is really tiring. You would have thought it would be easy because you just walk down the stairs and open up your computer at the table. This is great. I'm not going on the subway. I'm not commuting into work. But what I find is that 
in the old days, we had all these nice little breaks in our day, right? So I live in Manhattan when I'm not traveling for clients, all my clients are in the city. I get up in the morning, I get on the subway, I pop out in Midtown and I visit my favorite coffee shop and say hello to the guy to a nice chat. And then I go into a meeting. And then after the meeting, I probably stay in the conference room for a half an hour to organize my thoughts. I go down the elevator, I get on taxi and go across town, another meeting. And what you're seeing here is I'm getting all these little unintended breaks. In fact, we thought of them as inconveniences in the old days, but what they were doing is they were allowing my brain to reset itself. We don't have that right now. And we're, you know, much as we love our children, uh, and they now know what we do for a living in ways they never have before, um, they don't understand this, right? Children are fully present all the time. So you've got to find ways to create some space, create some borders, create some boundaries. Um, my wife has occasionally been losing her mind, and I said, look, honey, just go out and sit in the Jeep, right? Don't go anywhere. Just go out. <laughs> Close the door of the Jeep, put on some nice, nice music, it's a comfortable chair, and just chill out for a little while. Um, I've been getting up early or staying up a little too late sometimes and just reading, because for me, reading is very regenerative. But you've got to figure out ways that you can do that. And there's, look, while there's lots of ideas, I don't think there's any easy answers because all of us have different needs. But structure and ritual, I think, are really important. The commitment I made to my family was I was working seven days a week when we first started this, um, was that I would take from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. every single day, and I would have no meetings. We would have dinner as a family and watch a movie. We are now on, I think, day 60 of watching movies. I've got a great list of movies. If anybody wants it, I'll let you know. Fun movies, intelligent movies, educational movies, and that for me has been something I can look forward to every day. And now I'm saying I can't work seven days, clients. I'm going to need to take some some Saturdays and Sundays off. Going back to emotional intelligence. Um, so emotional intelligence is two things. It's about how do you manage yourself and how do you manage others? And of course, this stressing environment makes it much harder for us to manage ourselves as well as much harder for us to engage productively in others. I wrote an article um, a while back and did a webinar with Mohammed on this idea of resilience. If you're not resilient, you can't roll with the punches, you can't stay adaptable and flexible. So figuring out ways that you can stay resilient. But emotional intelligence starts with the idea of understanding yourself. What do I need? When am I at my best? What kind of environment will allow me to work well? And we, I think we all learned that along the way, except now everything has changed. So you have to ask yourself again, given this new model, when am I at my best? How do I manage my stress? How do I deal with the fact that, you know, I love my children, I have 10 year old twins. They don't care if I'm on a conference call. They wanna to talk to me. So they come right in, you might meet them at some point. Um, and you know, it just is what it is. And I'm not gonna get, I'm a perfectionist, but I'm not gonna get overly stressed about that. Um, so that's really important. And the final tip I'd give you is a couple of great questions, Miriam. The final tip I would give you is that under pressure, we can be very short with other people. We can be tough on them. We can be impatient. So not only manage your pressure, but I think this is a good time for all of us to think about that technique of asking rather than telling, right? So rather than saying, you need to pick up the game here. You're not working hard enough. I need you to do more of this. Say, hey, tell me how things are going. How do you feel your work is going? What's working well? What's not working well, right? Um, and this is less efficient but it's a way to engage people and come up with a better solution and make them feel like they are empowered to do it rather than just directing them. Look, I am by nature kind of a natural teller. I've had to learn in my profession that my clients don't always want me to tell, so I have to ask a good questions instead. And I think to, to work on your emotional intelligence, a really, really good way is to try to ask rather than tell and see how that works. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mariam. We have another question by Ali Faghehi. Ali. Hi, good evening. Ali, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, thanks. Uh, Mark, you, one of your advices was uh, to reduce uh, fixed costs, and the other one is to demonstrate your uh, humanity. How you can be fair and balanced between these two angles? I think it's unfair to uh, to fire people during these difficult times because they will not be able to get 
the new job and uh, get money to survive. So how do you think of these two angles? Okay, so it's reducing fixed costs and demonstrating humanity. All right. Ali, let me tell you the, um, the really, really bad news about leadership. So being a leader is not about choosing right from wrong. I hope. I hope that, and I, I really like the English word right because it means two things. It means intellectually correct and it also means ethically correct. So if you're choosing between right and wrong, I hope it's not hard because you should do the right thing intellectually and you should do the right thing ethically. The real problem for leaders is that oftentimes we have to choose between right and right. We have to choose between two good things. It is a good thing to reduce fixed costs. It's also a good thing to treat people fairly and to be generous and humane. I don't have an easy answer to that. These are the most difficult decisions we will make in our careers. Um, there always is going to be a trade-off. So you need to sit down. I think this is a great time to not try to figure out the answer yourself. I think it's important to get uh, advisors, to get your colleagues and your peers together, and to really look at these questions and say, let's think about this in a holistic way. Let's not make decisions as a one-off. Let's look at the entire system and say, what are we able or willing to trade off? If we have to make tough decisions on people, we have to do that humanely. We have to do that with decency. The flip side is that if someone's not performing, it's not good other than the paycheck, it's not good to keep them in a job. They're not going to succeed in longer term, right? I also would say to you that I think now is a great time to hire. Now, assume you can pay these people, but if you have got um, openings because people have left, because you've restructured, I think this is a pretty good talent market right now. And I think it's a great time to hire because the people who are going to be joining you are going to be very, very committed to being successful out of the gate. And the only thing you need to do is you need to spend a lot more time and be a lot more deliberate in onboarding them. Because, and I know this, I've got clients who, are, who I'm working with and who, who have hired people. And it's really hard to start a job when you don't go into the office, you just dial into a new Zoom uh, and stay in your house. So we have to make an extra effort to figure out how do we get people up to speed? How do we teach them the business? How do we broker relationships for them? How do we make sure that they're getting an understanding of our culture. But um, you know, like everything else, we all have to slow down right now. One of the reasons for being an essentialist is because we can't do as much as we used to do. So we better really focus on doing what's most important and not let the minor stuff get in the way. So I don't know if that's an answer. Um, if you had a specific case study, I, we could walk through it. But you know, again, the, the tough thing is, this situation is causing us to make very, very difficult decisions. You have to make them decisively, but you also have to figure out how can you get the best possible input and check your own intuitions. Thanks, Mark. Well, fair enough. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Ali. Mark, we have one last question from Sayed. Sounds good. <clears throat> Mark, can you hear me? I can. How are you today, Syed? Yeah, Alhamdulillah, good. I am fine. And uh, uh, I have a question. First of all, let me introduce a little bit for, for myself. My name is Syed Shahan, and I am currently working as an occupational health and safety trainer in the Saudi Arabia. Okay, my question is related to that. What type of new and smart skill in general do you think that are good to adopt for the employees who are working in the service providing organization? that can make them in line with the current scenario that is coming once we come over the situation with the COVID-19. And, and, and one more thing, can you guide some of the good uh, websites and some, some presentations that we can see and we can enhance our skills as well? Absolutely, I'd be happy to do that. I'll work with Mohammed, and we'll put together a little bibliography of websites and books and online articles that may be helpful. So um, I love the question and I think my response, remember, I come out of education. So I think that, um, I think human beings are like sharks. If a shark stops swimming, it dies. If a human being stops learning, I think it dies, he or she dies professionally. We have to continue to push ourselves to get better. Um, the companies that have been complacent about this historically 
are going to suffer the most. I'm, I'm going to do a, uh, an anecdotal. I'm not a business school professor, so I don't do research, but I'm going to do an anecdotal study after we get through this to see what kinds of companies succeeded and what kinds of companies struggled or failed. And the ones that succeeded are the ones that will succeed are the ones who constantly encourage and support their people to get better at their jobs and add new skills. They're gonna be the ones that show humanity, that understand that people have a choice of where they can work, so they're giving them something beyond just the paycheck. They're gonna be the companies that have leaders who are comfortable being human beings and who build very strong executive teams, right? Companies that are built on hub and spoke model executive teams, I think are, are not gonna be able to weather this crisis very well. So for someone like you, I would recommend deepening your current skill set and upgrading that, and then finding ways you can add additional related skills. Um, so I'll give you an example of this. Um, my son has a, a pallet expander. He had it put in about a year ago. So this is something that you put in. I don't those of you who have children. It's basically kind of like before you get braces, you put it in because you have to expand your jaw because there's not enough room for all the teeth to come in. They come in crooked. So he had this put in about a year ago. This kid is completely stoic. He never complains. In the middle of dinner last night, he says to me, I think this thing in my mouth just broke. I'm like, good Lord. <laughs> so um, I look at his mouth and I don't know, it's, it's a bunch of wires and things. I, I can't fix this thing. So I go, this is my wife's having a nervous breakdown. I said, what are we going to do? I said, does it hurt? Well, a little bit, which means it's probably killing him because he's very, very stoic. So luckily we were able to get the orthodontist who happened to be in the office last night, called up, thought we we're going to leave a voicemail. She goes, oh, yeah, I'm here. Just bring him down, put on a mask, put on some gloves, bring him down. We'll take care of this. Uh, and she had figured out a way to, to have everything very, very safe. And we didn't have much of a choice. And I said to her, why the heck are you in the office at eight o'clock on a, was a Monday night? What are you doing? Oh, well, I'm using this time because, you know, my children are now in bed. She has young children. I'm using this time to do additional training. I am getting a certification in some new thing. I'm making sure, you know, there's always new kinds of braces that are coming out for an orthodontist. So she's deepening her current skills and then she's doing a bunch of work on her systems so that when her staff comes back, they will be able to actually do more. So I think there's deepening your current skills, looking for, for adjacent skills, and then given that you're an occupational therapist, is this a time for you to think about who are my favorite kinds of clients? Um, you know, what do I most enjoy doing? And is there a way for me maybe to reposition my practice so that coming out of this, I'm spending more time on work I enjoy doing, on work I'm really good at and can differentiate myself and maybe even work that will pay me at a higher rate. But these are the kinds of questions I hope people are asking themselves, particularly like me, if you're more or less running a very small practice or uh, even an individual practice. That's good, thank you. That's a very valuable answer, thank you very much. Thank you, Sayed. My uh, pleasure. Mark, nice hearing from you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, 165 on. Uh, Mark, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been an exciting hour. And uh, I'll speak to you soon. Wonderful. Be well, everybody.